Welcome back to Introduction to Agroecology, Unit 11. This is part two on developing, restoring, and managing a healthy agroecosystem. Uh, here's just a picture of um, a conservationist going out into an area and looking at in a pasture of a co cover crop that they put in. Um, sometimes they're just grasses in, <clears throat> in a pasture, but this is one where they actually put clover um, that you're seeing here and the animals will eat that clover and they're looking to see how it's doing. Um, when we're looking at stuff, we're finding out that um, the research uh, is starting to show that there can be many stages that occur at the same time. It used to be you just look at one aspect of uh, the ecosystem to see what changes you could make and now we're starting to see that you can do simultaneous changes um, and it's a little bit more complicated to look at it, but we're finding out we can get the type of agroecosystem that we want in a quicker fashion um, doing the stuff naturally. Um, <clears throat> we can use minimum till with cover crops to achieve sustainability, we're finding out. So it's a little bit of tilling that we're doing. Um, and then when we're looking at the research that we need to figure out the frequency and intensity of the disturbances that are allowed. In other words, we were looking more, they were looking more at what do we do to keep things from being disturbed. And now we're looking to see, well, geez, maybe we should start looking and seeing what those limits are because they can vary with each type of thing we're working on. Um, this disturbance and succession or that recovery is um, something that's constantly occurring both back and forth. You disturb it, then it tries to recover. You disturb it, it tries to recover. Um, when does this happen? Uh, more specifically than what we said in the past, it's when you plant stuff, you're disturbing the soil. When you cultivate, you're turning the soil. Um, when you irrigate it, you're putting salts on there, so you're changing what uh, nutrients or what elements are in the soil. It's going to affect how stuff grows. <clears throat> if we're applying fertilizers and pesticides, that's certainly going to affect and change stuff. When we prune things, it changes the um, plants that we have, like trees for bushes, and they could be uh, infected with different diseases and pests. When we harvest, we're going in there and disturbing the soil um, by taking out the crop that's there, so the nutrients aren't going to be needed after that point for the rest of the season until the new crop's planted. And then when we do soil preparation, um, this could include preparing for the next crop or if you've never had a crop in and we're um, preparing it for the first time. Um, frequent occurrences over a period of time uh, certainly can have an adverse effect on the disturbances. In other words, how often is it happening and is it less than the amount of time it takes the ecosystem to recover for that area, that field, that region. And then when they occur naturally, um, immediately it attempts to recover from that disturbance. Uh, here's an example of a disturbance that it, we, they were grazing, there, this was an example of cattle were grazing and it actually, there was washout occurred because they ate down to the soil in this case, it, it looks like it was a uh, looks like there's a field up to the upper part of the picture there that you can see, and then there was a pasture from this point down to here. Well, they let them in an area way too long, and they ate it down to in this case it looks like sand or mostly sand soil anyway. And then when the uh, rain came, it washed out the area, and you see that big difference in um, probably three feet, four feet maybe that that much water came, they must have had a huge rain and it washed it all down that hill. And that's why you have to be careful at how long you let something graze. <clears throat> um, on recoveries or the succession, um, there's two types. There's primary and there's secondary. The primary is when uh, there's an ecosystem that hasn't had living organisms in it before. Um, that would be the first time an ecosystem is developing probably be in an area where the climate change where something couldn't exist and now it can. Um, you look at a primary thing of like the ice age when nothing would grow because of that um, and now it will. You could have rocks that turns into soil eventually. It just didn't have anything. When it can support organisms, then that's what a primary 
ecosystem is. Secondary one is where you're developing an ecosystem that pre previously had it, what we're trying to do is change it, okay? Um, it could be you don't like what it is and you want to change it to something else. It could be some of the examples they have here, there was a flood that wiped out an entire ecosystem, a fire burned an uh, ecosystem out, the intense bracing like in the prior picture, and they're certainly going to have to redevelop into a new one. And then if you had winds that would have blown the soil away, that could be an example of something that would be a secondary. So it's a second time or not the first time that something is going to be, you're trying to develop an ecosystem. Um, how long would it take to recover from something like that? If we look at that when they were overgrazing in that area, well, how long it takes depends on how damaging was the event or the extent of the damage that happened, how, how bad was it? The worse it is, the more it will take. Because some of that soil was washed away, you're probably going to have to level that off there or get some of that soil that might be down in a creek or something and bring it back in. So it could take quite a while. Um, how frequently does it happen? Is it an area that you have um, rains that always wash that out? Maybe it was an area that that was like that before, but they had put the grasses in and that kept it from happening. So maybe that's an area you shouldn't graze in. Um, because it's just going to take too long. By itself, it couldn't recover very easily. Um, how intense was it? Was it a huge flood? Was it a, a, a fire that was superficial? Was it a fire that was deep into the soil? Because it went deep into the soil, it would have ruined more of the uh, biota that was there. You wouldn't have the type of organisms that you wanted. Um, also, uh, for each event and the amount of time in between those events, which is an author, we've kind of been saying that all along, if it occurs more often than it takes to recover, it's never going to recover. Um, how does change occur in a ecosystem? Well, it's biotic, it's living, so there's changes to the environment through those interferences. Um, and in the prior chapter, we talked about the interferences. Um, there's competition between existing species, so like the survival of the fittest. Um, that can help determine which one's going to be there. Um, the energy flows that between the biomass changes and some of the stuff that could change those energy, energy flows. If you have uh, animals out there, herbivores eating the grasses, then it's going to change that energy flow dynamic because they're eating part of what's there. It's going to change what's there, um, and it could be in a good or a bad way depending on how you use it. Um, natural succession um, has been bypassed. In other words, we're going in there and creating the interferences. Um, one example is farmers putting inputs, so they might be changing the uh, organisms that are there based on the fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides that they're putting in there. Um, because the natural process would have, to some extent, tried to take care of anything that wasn't a good thing. Um, they need to remove non-renewable pollution uh, producing inputs, um, for instance, using uh, mechanized equipment. Uh, they need to learn to use natural succession to our advantage. In other words, go back to nature. Don't use all these human inputs to try to change what's happening uh, based on what we've already talked about in Chapter 1 and 2, that it, we're finding out it's not really working. Um, we're also finding out that we need to do more research. We really, as much as and as long as we've been here, we really don't know as much as we thought we did. And that's why we have to look and see when we do these disturbances, can we come up with some guideline on how to do it um, to produce a system that the disturbance and the recovery works in conjunction with each other and it's just a naturally occurring thing where we get the best result. But that's the stuff where the research, we have to try differing things to see if we can get that to happen. Um, might be that we're not allowing enough time for that develop, successional development um, to work. We, it just needs more time than what it is. We might say, geez, why doesn't it recover in a year? Oh, we're going to throw fertilizer on it because it didn't do what it is. Well, maybe what we need to do is start using crops that instead of developing the huge harvest that we have, that find a crop that will produce something that produces a good harvest, but also allows some of the nutrients to stay in the soil and try to not do things that are going to screw up that recovery process and see how long it really does take. Um, it can, and of course, it can also take uh, too long. Um, 
here's just an example of a conservationist um, from natural resources um, talking with a farmer on some of the different things they, they're trying to do in a particular area. Uh, here it looks like they have some grasses and some wildflowers that are growing in an area. They're probably letting the soil rust for a while. And they're going to see, hey, how does this work? Does the ecosystem, is it going to help out if we grow this for a year and then try something else? Will we be better off? Does it have a wet, better soil biota? Is the crop production, the yield we get going to be better? Um, so what we need to try to do is design a something that's sustainable, in other words, lasts for a long time, of, of an ecosystem, agroecosystem um, that we manage and not try to make it something that it's not. In other words, we want to mimic that natural succession. Let nature take its course, okay? So we want to get the right combinations of plants and animals that will work and develop those interactions. Um, and the various crops that you have, it might be doing more cover crops that you hadn't done in the past, maybe resting your soil every fourth or fifth year, those types of things. Um, that are going to help make that soil biota better or return some of the nutrients that are beneficial and that the, the plants will use. Um, we can also plant some plants that promote nitrogen fixing bacteria or phosphorus trapping micro -aze, um, that will um, actually benefit the plants you're trying to grow. And different plants have different needs. Um, and as we're developing it, we talked about this early in this section, that as we do this, if it's working right, your diversity will increase and the foods we're producing are going to be more complex. Because of that, you're going to have interactions, mutualism, which back in uh, Chapter 9 we talked about mutualism. But that was, it's two things will work in conjunction with each other and use what's happening to benefit each other. Or one will produce something that helps the next one or vice versa. And that, let that happen naturally, and they will do that. Um, some things will outperform others, but these are, mutualism is one where it does uh, uh, some type of interaction that will help each other in a natural fashion. And then that's going to lead to uh, improved disease and pest management, and certainly because we're going to do that naturally and not through some type of synthetic um, version. When that happens, it's going to become more complex, and then we're going to get an integrated, if it's all working like it should, an integrated agroecosystem that's going to work in harmony with the rest of the local ecology. And ultimately, from the area you are, your farm, let's say, out into the region that you're in, maybe the community, and then from community between communities, and so on and so forth. Um, here's just an example of diversity. We talked about having um, the, here's just a farmstead, and you're seeing some pasture land with trees in it, and that eventually there'll be crops in that. It's just showing that it's, here's a diverse thing growing on its own. The things are out there, and it's not, there's not much interference from the farmer. Um, how do we do this? How do we get serious about doing this? Well, you do it by creating and, and working with a system that has more intervention in its management than a traditional system, okay? But you plan for that to happen, and then you test different outcomes so that you can get the results you want. So you test until you get to the point you want to be. The benefit, ultimately, is that we get away from our human inter intervention, which is it starts with that intervention, and then we find out what works, and then we let nature take its course, and it's going to happen um, without um, the need for our human dreaded inputs, uh, the ones that haven't worked so much. Um, some of the things that you can do, how do you know if it's working? Well, here's an example of you're having a uh, natural resource conservationist come out and test your soil. So you find out if it has the nutrients that it needs. And this is uh, happening out in California. It looks like in an orchard based on looking at this. But you see they have animals uh, in their orchard too. Um, there's different steps you can do to allow that succession or that recovery to happen. And that's by planning the first one step you can do for a first step is planting a crop after the first harvest that grows rapidly, uh, gives you an early yield, and it gives a new, puts nutrients back into the soil. And those are called pioneer plants, pioneer in, in the fact that they would have been something from uh, earth shattering first time they were being done by the 
people that come out to uh, break the soil of the West. And, and that's what, in terms of allowing for that, some of the stuff you can try, that's a good first step. Um, what you can also do is plant um, multiple varieties. That's the polyculture. The mono is just with growing corn and that's it. But growing differing plants, different varieties when you plant them, don't plant the same thing every year. And that's going to help change stuff. Uh, and that possibly could provide the same results of putting in cover crops or legumes, the alfalfas, the weeds. Um, what's, what does that do? Well, if you get one that works in the right way with the right combination of plants, you're going to get uh, biomass being returned to the soil. The, in other words, the uh, chafe or the, the rest of the plant once you harvest what you got. Is the best way to say that. Uh, nitrogen fixing, that's putting nitrogen back in the soil. So you're putting, uh, uh, one of the plants you're planting is putting um, um, the nitrogen back into the soil. And then if you start using livestock and pasturing them uh, to remove the weeds and, you know, when they're feeding themselves, um, then that could really, really help uh, in terms of allowing the pro progression to happen, the recovery to happen um, by itself. This could be used in place of step one. Um, you can skip step one and do step two. Um, so that's entirely possible. Um, here's an example of... Um, a landowner, he's trying to talk about weed control and irrigating um, his crop of ligandberries, and this is in Arkansas. Um, this farmer happens to use waste from a local fish cannery um, as fertilizer, so ligandberries don't necessarily put the fertilizer back in, but he's supplementing what he's doing so that he can um, provide it without using something synthetic. It's the waste from the fish. So very, very, very good first step. And what they're trying to find out, does it work or doesn't it? And it's one of those tests we talked about four or five slides ago. Also, they have uh, drip irrigation, the black line you see here. Um, a lot of irrigation on farming areas, is, they spray the, the water all across the hole. There's a lot of evaporation, a lot of salt um, gets into the soil that doesn't necessarily always leach out that could affect crops in the future. Um, this, it doesn't have any um, loss of um, water because it just drips out right close to where the plants are. And it does it, um, generally it's on timers to do it given it only when it needs it, so it's a lot more efficient way to, to do irrigation if you need to do it. Of course, we've also learned the best ways to try to not do irrigation. Um, when you do the ir irrigation, um, we're starting to get an initiation to what changes to the environment are happening. We just have to become aware of that. A lot of times we do need the help from biologists and conservationists that can help us try to see what changes are happening. But when that's happening, what that's going to do is help develop um, macroorganisms and microorganisms that are needed to enrich the soil, that soil biotic getting better. Um, step three, um, after you get through that initial stage, um, looking at possibly planting a perennial crop, and that's a plant that will come back every year. Um, there isn't corn or soybean or wheat or alfalfa that, that comes back in that type of fashion. Um, alfalfa and wheat, some of it possibly can, but it generally doesn't keep its production capabilities up unless you plant new, new plants. Um, for most varieties. Um, it's going to leave more organic matter if you have a perennial plant because that will die down every year and then you wouldn't plow it because if it plowed it you'd be tearing it all up. So it will die off and it will leave that chafe on the ground that helps for providing uh, uh, nitrogen into the soil. And then it also can have a modification to your microclimate depending on the type of crop that you have. In other words, your climate could change based on that plant being there more of the time. Uh, another thing you can do, this is what they call step four, and that's introducing trees um, to improve the environment and the soil in which you're growing in. So possibly you could put an orchard in there. You could do tree cropping where you grow the, the types of trees that, um, that will help stabilize soil, but then you can sell them off to nurseries, let's say. Um, some of that's being tried to see how that works out. 
and then you can use longer-lived perennials, um, and that's around and to provide that diversity for different insects uh, coming in, and maybe if you have a disease problem, you can plant different perennials that'll always be there. Yeah, you know, um, that, that will help that process of the crops that you happen to be growing. Um, once you get the trees in, and the ones you leave, not the ones you sell the nursery things, you can plant, once they start growing up, different annuals in between the trees. Uh, you could possibly put um, vegetables in there if you wanted to grow a few vegetables, as long as it, it would be something that would grow underneath the tree, because sometimes trees would block out the sun right underneath them. Um, and then you could use livestock for vegetation management. So if you had an area where the weeds were getting too much, well, if you have a fence around everything, you can control where your livestock are. You can move them to that area and help them clean out that vegetation. Um, haven't mentioned it in the past, but sheep are an extremely good uh, measure to, if you wanted to get rid of um, weeds or grasses in an area, they pretty much can clean it up down to nothing. Um, when all this happens, as it develops, hopefully that that when those trees are getting larger in that, you're going to see an improvement in the nutrient cycling of how that, it's not letting all the water go away and it's not letting all the uh, nutrients leach out. Those types of things um, are going to start occurring. And then after um, we have done that step six, uh, after the trees are fully developed, uh, you can keep doing the same things and repeat four, five, and six of putting in perennial crops, uh, letting the trees grow, having nursery trees, and um, putting in annuals uh, underneath the trees when they get large enough. Or you can take out all the stuff you put in and start over again. And there'll be some of that going on to see if, if we do that disturbance, is that a good thing for long term? Is it better not to do anything? So those types of experiments are what's going to be happening. But after we create that new system, what we're going to find out, um, we're going to return that to what the initial stages of success were to begin with. And then most of the additions that we put in there, they're believing will be lost. It, it, it's, it's not a, you know, it's not that it's going to be a bad thing, that the, you just don't need them. That the um, replacement stuff, it's working like it should. Your agroego system is working as it should. And you know, all we have to do is maintain what we have. And they believe that will work very well once we get the right combination for your area, for that ecosystem. Um, and then there are probably going to be some areas that not everything, not every area is going to accept it and work from having the disturbance to the succession and back and forth. So you might have to do changes to do another disturbance to try to control it because it isn't doing what you want. Um, but if you do it in a controlled manner in a small area, you should be able to have that whole huge area and still have that new great system, but then do those little tweaks to it um, to make the system work like we'd like it to. Um, here's just an example of pasturing some grazing cattle out there, and you see that there's a tree out in, inside the middle of the pasture. And eventually, once they get done with that, they might return that to a farm field for a few years and then move the pastures to where some of the farm field is right now. Um, what's the biggest challenges? What is the right mixture of plant and animal? Um, a lot of times that proves to be challenging, but that's the experiment that we need to do to try, try to get that right combination and try to learn the best we can and keep uh, sharing that information with other people and make sure everyone understands that. Um, when is the right time to introduce a disturbance that's going to create a productive agro system? Well, that's a huge, huge, huge question. Um, here is a list of the first page of all the pictures and graphs that we had in this second part. And here is the second page. <clears throat> 